Right on. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, our Environment and Climate Change Speaker Spotlight. Today, we're talking about Métis cultural burning. So please continue to introduce yourself in the chat, um, and we'll get going here. So thank you again to everybody for joining today's session. I know it's a beautiful August evening, so I really appreciate you all taking the time to be in here and learning with us. My name is Ali Greenslade. I'm a climate engagement coordinator and policy analyst with the Métis Nation of Alberta. I grew up in central Alberta, m and Region 4, and the lands of many Indigenous peoples in Treaty 6 territory, namely the Montana, Urban Skin, and Samson Cree Nations who live where I grew up, spending lots of time with my family at Pigeon Lake. Um, I myself am not Indigenous, but I'm passionate about finding ways to encourage sustainability and be better to the earth. So thank you all for joining in this conversation. Um, I worked at the m and just over a year, and I can't believe that this is the eighth speaker spotlight session we've done. Um, it really is a pleasure to be able to have this dedicated space to bring people together to learn and talk about Métis environmental stewardship and climate change. And that's what we're doing today. So the speaker spotlight invites Métis community members and industry professionals to share their skills and knowledge. And today we're really thrilled to have someone who is truly both. Um, Dane D'Souza works for the Métis National Council doing climate change policy and emergency management work. Um, but for a long time, I really just knew him as that fire guy at MNC. Um, so we're really thrilled to have um, Dane here tonight and teach us all a little bit more about Métis cultural burning. So thank you again, Dane, for being here. Um, please continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, I'll just pass it over to my colleague, Jen, who's helping out tonight, if you want to say hi, Jen. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I also can't believe this is the eighth one of these that we're doing, but it's really exciting to have Dean here. Um, I've gotten to know him through a variety of different work events and stuff, and he really is incredibly passionate about this topic and um, brings a wealth of knowledge. So I think this will be a really exciting session. And um, yeah, big thanks to Ali for putting these on. They're incredible. And it's nice to see our community come together. I myself am Métis. I'm um, up in Edmonton now, but I was born and raised in Calgary. And um, I am the climate change engagement and policy manager at the Métis Nation of Alberta. So um, yeah, excited to be here, excited to see all of you. I hope all of you are maybe coming to the AGA and you can come see us there, but I'll let Ali, I'm just really the, the keyboard behind Ali's show. So I'll let her continue. Thanks, Jen. I just realized I forgot to ask you before I introduce, introduce yourself. So thanks. And yeah, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of us, either of us, um, or, or pop questions into the chat. So moving along, uh, this is the plan for tonight. Um, I'll share an opening prayer, prayer provided by Alden Norma Spicer in just a moment. And then we'll go over, um, I'm just going to talk for a little bit longer. I'll share a couple of exciting things our team's doing, and then I'll hand it over to Jane. Um, we will have time for questions at the end. Um, like I said, please feel free to type questions in the chat or the Q&A throughout the session. Um, and if anything's not answered, we'll circle back to them at the end. I'm also going to share a few poll questions, um, barring all technology works in my favor. Um, so we'll have a couple of pauses for those throughout the session. And uh, just a reminder, while during the presentation, I'll just ask if everybody could keep themselves muted and we'll avoid some annoying background feedback all that stuff. So with that, um, we're now going to open the session with a prayer from Elder Norm Spicer, um, who pre-recorded this for us, and to fit the content um, of these engagements specifically. So I'll share that now. Welcome to the MA Spotlight on Wildfire. Fire is the most important global agent of ecological disturbance and responsible for the dynamics, biodiversity and productivity of many of Canada's ecosystems. Métis people have long used traditional knowledge of fire and understood that cultural burning was a beneficial tool to support their subsistence lifestyle. The effects of European colonization displacement of our people from their traditional territories and criminalization of their cultural burning practices eliminated human ignited surface fires from many Western forests. Species and ecosystems are unable to resist 
or recover from intense burning, a situation further intensified by climate change. Please join me in a prayer asking the Creator to help us restore ecosystem integrity and resilience. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for our Métis ways of living and being. We ask for your wisdoms, guidance, and blessings as we strive to be good stewards of this beautiful world you have left in our keeping. Let your presence be with us today as we focus our discussions on the teachings of our ancestors passed down through the generations. Their traditional knowledge taught us the impacts of fire and how cultural burning can help us restore our forests. Let us use this knowledge to develop the potential future of Métis wildfire management. Lord, grant us the wisdom to care for the earth. Help us to act now for the good of future generations and all your creatures. We give thanks for those whose courage has awoken the world in part into action and ask that the eyes of all be open to the tasks before us to make good again that which has been badly spoiled. This is your world, Lord, beautiful, bountiful, yet fragile when abused. May we in faith see this world through your eyes, hear this world through your ears, touch this world through your hands, and bless this world through your grace. We place our trust in you now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you again to Elder Norma for providing that for us and for all the research and thought that she puts into these prayers um, so we can begin these sessions in a good way. So with that, um, I'm just going to quickly talk about a few um, updates from our team. I promise I won't take too long. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Dane. So if you're here for our last session, um, we went through an overview of all the work that our um, MMA Environment and Climate Change team does. Um, I promise I'm not going to go through all of these different things, but just a high level overview of all the kind of conservation, environmental monitoring and renewable energy work um, we're doing and we're continually looking on how to increase Métis resilience to climate change and impacts. Um, if you're curious about the work we do, uh, like I said, the last session was an overview of everything. We also have our next uh, AGA report coming out soon here. Um, and uh, always are posting lots of things online and in the MA bi weekly newsletter. Um, if you're not signed up to that newsletter, lots of great stuff in there. Maybe, Jen, if you want to pop that link in the chat, um, I'll also send it in a follow up email. I'll just highlight a couple projects. Um, if you haven't heard, the Metis Nation has built a solar farm out of Metis Crossing. It's uh, almost done. Uh, the, the end date has gotten pushed back a couple times, but we're still really close. Right now, it's set to be done this fall, um, and it's the largest wholly Métis-owned solar project. Um, it's 4.86 megawatts, and it was designed in that size, so it'll offset all of the m and and affiliates energy or electricity use. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, another thing about the solar project is we, we reached out to citizens and did some engagement on what the, the name should be. I know myself, I'm really tired of saying Métis Crossing Solar Project. I'm so really looking forward to having a new name and that will be unveiled at the AGA next weekend. So stay tuned for that. Another new program we have um, is we're launching berry monitoring. So you might be familiar with some of our fish monitoring forms. Um, we've launched a similar process for uh, traditional plants and berries. So if you're heading out to harvest some berries, um, please feel free to let us know how that went. Um, if you submit these forms, you will be entered to win uh, in a draw to win some, some cool prizes. Um, and we can share that link as well if anyone's interested. Finally, um, as I mentioned, AGA is coming up uh, August 11th or 10th to 13th um, out at uh, Smoky Lake at Métis Crossing. Uh, the theme for the event this year is solar. So we'll be highlighting the solar project. Um, also our environment and climate change team will have a booth there. So please feel free to come say hi. We'll be raffling off two emergency preparedness kits, a bunch of cool solar stuff and have lots of information. So if you're there, please, please come say hi. 
Um, lastly, we um, always send a follow-up survey after these sessions. We're always really looking forward to um, hearing from you, how they go, any ideas you have for future sessions. Maybe if you have an idea and you want to lead one or know someone who would like to, please reach out to climatemat.org. Um, it is really useful for us in planning to hear, hear from uh, your feedback and what people want to learn more about. Um, so I'll send that follow-up email out. And if, as a thank you for filling out the survey, you'll have a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. All right, so I think that's enough for me tonight. Um, with that, I'll pass it over to Dave. And thanks again for being here, Dave. And I will stop sharing. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Ali. And uh, thank you, Elder Norma Spicer, for starting us off in a, a good way. And also, pretty much stealing all my speaking notes for the night here. I don't have, I don't have much more to say than that. We can all go home. Um, but I, before I dive into this, can I give me a head nod, Allie, if my screen is coming up? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank Allie and Jen both for inviting me to be here today and uh, all the M&A Environment team for not only working tirelessly to you know, really put forward some awesome accomplishments, but also just being wonderful people to work with. So uh, greatly appreciated. I'm very honored to be here tonight. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll give a bit of a background of who I am. Uh, my name is Dane D'Souza. I'm an M&A citizen. My family names are Sutherland and Sinclair from the Selkirk area of the Red River Valley. Uh, I'm the Climate Change and Emergency Management Policy Advisor for the Métis National Council. I was born and raised in Treaty 7, Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, Mokinsis, Calgary, Alberta. Um, and before I started this role, I spent uh, six years as a wildland firefighter for the government of Alberta. I was based out of Rocky Mountain House, and I was fortunate enough to fight fires from High Level to Castle Mountain, uh, out to BC, the Yukon, Idaho, Ontario, uh, and in 2018, I did a master's at UBC that uh, looked into the application of Indigenous fire management practices and techniques as a, a means of providing climate resilience to the developing world in places that haven't experienced fires before, but will experience fires as a result of climate change. Um, so while I was at UBC, I was fortunate enough to make some connections that uh, eventually led to me being contracted to lead a research project on the connection between the Métis Nation and uh, fire and wildfire. Um, so I've been working on that project for longer than I'll say on camera. Um, and in the course of working on that project, uh, it's it's been a wonderful opportunity and path of discovery and reconnecting to my Métis heritage. And through it, I've been able to uncover certain truths and reintroduce myself to Métis culture and the community. And in so, uh, I, I've learned a lot and relearned a lot of what it means to be Métis. And uh, one of the truths that I have learned that is at the core of Métis identity, uh, the very essence of what it means to be Métis, is a connection to the land, the waters, the skies, the plants, the medicines and animals that, that make up our homeland. Um, and as I progress down this path of research, I've also learned how important fire is and connecting us as Métis people to all those elements of our homeland. How fire is a teacher and a tool, a mother and a medicine, a means of satisfying spiritual, physical, and communal necessities. So with that said, I'd like to do my best to uh, impart upon you tonight the story of Métis fire. Uh, I'll be talking first a bit about the history of wildfire and fire on the land in Canada, uh, or what is now known as Canada, and then I'll be starting to track things more to a contem contemporary kind of lens and perspective of where we're at today, a bit of why we're seeing what we are seeing, and then, you know, what's our place in the future? Uh, what can we learn? What can we bring forward uh, to not only provide wildfire resiliency for our communities and, you know, Canada at large, um, but also to reconnect some of our heritage and who we are? So before I do that, I understand there is a poll question. So I'm going to take a sip of water and I'll let Allie deal with that. All right, it should be up now. I hope everyone can see that. Great, I see some answers coming in. That's a great sign. I just want to check in and see what everybody's familiarity is with um, cultural burning and kind of see where the group is at. All right, lots of people have heard of it. Some are very familiar. Some are brand new. 
All right, I'll give it a couple more seconds if anyone else wants to answer. Cool, I think we have 90% of people answer there. So I'll end that, share the results. Awesome, so lots of people have heard about it and we have one person who's very familiar. So I don't know if you answered, Dane, but maybe someone else can, can jump in. <laughs> Awesome. All right, well, back over to you. Great. Well, uh, I've done my best to try to put everything here together um, to kind of run the gamut of experiences with cultural burning in, in, in this topic. But should you have any questions, anything like that, please toss them into the chat. Or if we have time at the end uh, today, I'd be so glad to kind of answer any questions you might have. Um, so in order to tell this story, we the story of Métis cultural burning, uh, we need to do a bit of stage setting. And we have to go back pretty far to set this stage. In fact, we have to go back roughly about 14,000 years ago. So roughly 14,000 years ago, the Laurentide glaciers, or I've been told by some French Canadians, I pr pronounced that wrong, but this is an M&A speaker spotlight. So I'm gonna keep pronouncing it as the Laurentide glaciers, uh, was an ice sheet that was about a kilometer thick, if not more, and it stretched all the way from what are now the Rocky Mountains to uh, the Hudson's Bay and then a bit beyond that. And so as this glacier started to recede roughly 14,000 years ago, um, the Rocky Mountains, the prairies, foothills, interior plains, Canadian Shield, the Hudson Bay lowlands, they all started to be kind of shaped by this recession. And over the next 1,000 years of this recession, uh, pioneering species of trees such as poplars and fast growing grasses, uh, they've begun to spring up and dominate the landscape. It would look very similar to kind of what you would see in um, Cypress Hills if anybody's ever had the opportunity to check out that awesome uh, national park in the Southeast of the province. So as these kind of prairie grasslands and uh, aspen stands began to dominate this landscape, there was about 10,000 years before the boreal forest was able to catch up. So the boreal forest is that thick conifer forest that's pretty much like, as soon as you go north of Red Deer, if you've seen a forest, it's the boreal forest. So that, that thick, dense spruce, uh, lodgepole pine kind of forest that we're familiar with today, began to come in about 10,000 years ago and creep behind that prairie grassland land and start to dominate uh, a lot of Northern Canada. And so from the very inception of these forests and ecological zones, fire, fires always played a very indispensable role in the cycling of nutrients and life on the land. Uh, fires helped to define the borders of these ecological zones that you see on the graph there. And I kind of like to think of this cycle as a rhythm of the land. So keep that in mind, rhythm of the land, because I'll be referencing it quite a bit as we go on here. So diving a bit more into that in forest cycles. So over time, forest landscapes have become thick with vegetation, trees, foliage, shrubs, they build up on the forest floor until a disturbance such as wind, flood, disease, or fire sweeps through and disturbs the structure of the forest. Um, so these disturbances are usually a catalyst for returning nutrients and carbon to the soil and clearing out areas of dense forests that expose ground level vegetation to sunlight, restarting phases of growth throughout the forest. So out of the disturbances I just listed, wildfire has been the primary catalyst for setting this, this cycle and this rhythm. And up until recently, the prevalent theory in Western academia has been that lightning was the lead conductor of this rhythm. However, contemporary consensus and research in academia is starting to realize that this historic orchestration of the rhythm of fire on the land also was orchestrated by indigenous peoples of what is now Canada. Uh, indigenous peoples of Canada not only recognize this rhythm, but they applied fire to the land to suit their own motifs and kind of change the tune a little. So it's becoming increasingly well documented that this, this cycle and the fire that maintained it were part of our, how our First Nations ancestors and relatives interacted with and managed the land. And what is now termed as 
indigenous burning is actually ubiquitous throughout human culture around the world. Wherever there are humans, there's fire and there has been fire. And I'm not talking about campfires. I mean, fires on the land set by humans for a myriad of reasons. Fire can be thought of as like an expression of how the landscape itself is formed and then uh, well expressed. It's where climate, vegetation, topography, how all those things come together and determine how a fire behaves, what it renews and what it removes. So across the Métis motherland, there's already this rich and unique history of fire on the land that colonial academia and science is only beginning to scratch the surface of. It's a history or flame that has been kept by our elders, knowledge keepers, our, our trappers and burners. These histories, methods, and knowledge of fire on the land were passed down through teachings, traditions, and community throughout First Nations history and upon the formation of the Métis Nation, the Métis culture, Métis identity, passed on to us and through our communities. So I'd like to talk a bit more about that now. I mentioned earlier, and I, met, I will mention again, how fire is a way in which we connect to the land and the world around us. And I'd like to elaborate on that now and how that pertains to the Métis. Métis culture has always historically been of two worlds, First Nations and European, farms and trap lines, red river carts and river lots, portages and prairies, moving and working with the rhythm of, rhythms of the land, the cycles of the seasons to meet our needs and live in a good way. Our uses for fire were specific to the lands we applied them to, and they were just as varied as the lands that we occupied. In the spring burning season, Métis communities and families would meet with their neighbors and discuss the land and how fire could be applied to meet their needs and heal the land. These spring fire camps brought together Métis, First Nations, and settlers to build a consensus on how fire could be applied to the land to suit the needs of the entire community and all those living on the land in a good way. So this could mean burning around ponds or sloughs to invigorate the growth of reeds and grasses that serve as nesting spots for migratory birds and spawning areas for fish, exposing algae to sunlight and creating more oxygen for the fish that are in those sloughs and ponds. Trap lines in the wetlands were burnt to attract muskrat and rodents to feast on the shoots of new growth after the burn. Fields and meadows were burnt to stimulate the growth of berries, medicines, and nutrient-packed foods. Interestingly enough, fireweed, which is in the middle of that slide, uh, it's one of the first plants to regenerate after a wildfire, hence the name fireweed. But it was also historically known as Métis asparagus for our use of its fresh shoots and our meals and its importance to our people as medicine. Fires were also used to clear a path through thick forests, keeping portages and travel corridors open and easy to move through. Hunting grounds were burnt in a timely fashion to ensure that browsing and grazing ungulates like moose, deer, and elk and caribou would return to offer their abundance. And on the prairies, fires would be lit to steer mighty buffalo herds or coax game out of difficult terrain. Across the motherland, fire was used to ensure the prosperity of medicines like fireweed, willow shoots, jack pine, and aspen. And all this was carried out with the core value of respect for the land and its fire. Fire was respected, sacred, and revered for its power to heal and create, as opposed to this kind of modern perception of fire being destructive and bad. So if you were to ask me, what's the difference between First Nations fire and Métis fire? I would answer that fire doesn't belong to any one people, but rather fire belongs to the land as we do. Métis fire knowledge is the same as First Nations fire in that it is specific to the landscape, to the land, to the climate, to the flora and the fauna that occupy the land. We learn from our First Nations relatives how to manage fire on the land and continue the ancient science of using fire to heal and care for the world around us and in turn our communities. Our Anishinaabeg, uh, sorry, excuse me, Anishinaabeg relatives passed on to us the spiritual teachings of the sacred fire and the seven fires prophecy, which was honored in Métis households alongside our European ancestors' Christian teachings. Our swampy Cree ancestors taught us how vital fire is to maintain the health of wetlands for all creatures who dwell in them, from muskrat to moose. Our Plains Cree ancestors taught us to apply fire to keep areas open for good medicines to grow. 
Think of all the Métis communities with prairie in the name that are now blanketed in the thick spruce and pine boreal forest. Round prairie, high prairie, paddle prairie. These were our prairies, our ancestors' prairies, our pantries and our medicine cabinets, stocked and maintained by putting fire on the land in a good way. The Métis are, and were, a diverse people, defined by the landscapes that we interacted with, the ancestors we claim, the teachings we maintain, united in our connections and distinct in our family histories, as are our fires. I'd like to share a quote with you from my research. I was fortunate enough to interview some amazing fire keepers, fire experts from across the Métis Nation, and uh, two of which are Solomon and Renee Carrier. And uh, if tonight's topic interests you, I'd highly recommend giving them a Google. They're two of the most interesting folks I've had the pleasure of talking to. They live a traditional lifestyle up on the North Saskatchewan Delta, keeping uh, Métis trapping traditions and burning alive up there. And while I was interviewing them, they talked about how fire helped us connect over great distance. And Solomon said, you know, when we were burning, we would look to the north and we could see fire over there. And, oh, that's, that's Bob's smoke. That's Bob burning over there. And then we'd look to the south and, oh, that's Sam. And that's kind of how it's been in the Cumberland Delta. And Renee followed that up by saying, I think they call it fire Facebook. Back in the day, you actually knew that all families were sort of wrapping up the winter, that they were okay. When you saw a fire, you knew who was making it. So moving along in our history, after the Northwest resistance, the Métis were increasingly moved across the prairies and up into the boreal forests and swamps. And the script system saw Métis families and communities push further north and to the west, deeper into the boreal forests and wetlands of Western Canada pushing further into lands that have more frequent fire cycles. We continue to follow the rhythm of the land and connect to that rhythm through fire, continue to learn and share with our First Nations counterparts, neighbors, and relatives in those areas, living on the land in a good way and passing fire and its teachings through generations. And in the late 1800s and through the 1900s, Canada continued to disenfranchise the Métis, Métis people from our lands and their traditions through residential schools, forced assimilations, and the destruction of families and the traditions that they passed down. We know now, as we knew then, that there were resources and wealth to be extracted. And in the eyes of Ottawa, we were in the way. But in the late 1800s, they came for our fire. Surveyors and settler scientists lamented the economic destruction of wildfires on the Canadian forest interest. Fires were seen as adverse to the goals of confederation and settlement. Burning was discouraged, and the first laws against putting fire on the land were passed. And in the beginning, these laws and regulations were difficult to impose upon remote Métis communities, and very little changed. Many P Métis people actually found work as guides for forest guardians and eventually became firefighters themselves in order to secure extra income and protect their communities while maintaining that connection to fire. And over the course of the 1900s, as public perception of bad fire continued to be fueled by forestry and conservation campaigns, and Métis traditions and communities continued to suffer under the residential school system, the 60s scoop, and the continued legacy of colonialism, our relationship to fire changed once again. Métis peoples have and continue to work across the homeland as wildland firefighters and fire rangers protecting their communities and continuing our legacy of fire. And according to interviewees, the 1980s really marked an end of our burns. Provincial powers cracked down on the enforcement of burning bans and resource extraction interests crept ever deeper into the boreal forest. Modern fire management in North America is widely focused towards the suppression of fires as opposed to the prevention, mitigation or management of fires. And in Alberta, once fires are detected within the forest protection area, crews are mandated to begin fire suppression before the fire grows larger than two hectares and contain the spread by 10 a.m. the next morning. And ultimately, the goal here is fire extinguishment and suppression, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But it begs the question of what can be done better before a fire starts. How can we better control the factors that determine fire behavior during peak season? And is suppression and extinguishment the basket in which most of our eggs should be piled? This current approach favors reaction as opposed to prevention, and it's often driven by a gamble on austerity. Should you have a fire, slow, slow fire season, 
it looks like a genius move to have not invested in prevention. However, when that coin flips, and it inevitably does, there seems to be this confused attitude from decision makers of how could this happen? And they dust off the word unprecedented. And since I've begun working on the policy realm of emergency management, I've seen stats and quotes ranging from $1 of prevention equating to a range of $3 to $10 in response savings. But that number doesn't really capture the ecological, social, environmental, economic, technological, and cultural benefits of wildfire prevention and returning fire to the land. I'll talk a bit later about the structure of wildfire management in Alberta, but think about the training opportunities, research, job opportunities, and environmental benefits that could come from returning fire to the land through Métis hands. Fortunately, I'm not alone in thinking this way. Over the past decades, Western science and traditional knowledge have met at a crossroads and have come to a, come to a cons clear consensus that removing fire from the land has created fires that are more destructive than healing. Destructive to the land and destructive to our communities. As Stephen J. Pine put it, we replace fires of choice with fires of chance. So moving a bit forward to modern day realities of the Métis relationship with wildfire, we have to kind of look at rural and remote Métis communities that are embedded throughout areas that are known as the wildland urban fit interface or the WUI. It's where wildfires and communities meet. And across the Métis homeland, each community has their own story of how fires have threatened their lives and livelihoods. Although the Fort McMurray fires, Lytton fires, Chuck Egg fire, and others like them make international headlines. Each spring now marks the beginning of another fire season in which Métis communities face the threat of wildfire impacts that don't make pride pride news. Journalists and national interests aren't present to capture the culturally unsafe circumstances and community disruption that we face as a result of evacuations. The racist and colonial structure of wildfire management organizations is a stifled reality faced by those who devote their labor and well-being to the protection of their communities. Métis wildland firefighters are chronically treated as an expendable and unskilled labor force, despite wildfire being a generational craft deserving of pride and respect. Now, I'll elaborate on these things a bit more as we move forward. But for now, I'd like to hone in on evacuations and some of the climate impacts that we're seeing on fires. So, we should come at the both. Oh, there we go. Got them at the both times there. Um, as these graphs show, evacuations have been on a steady rise over the last several decades. And particular years of note are 2016's Fort McMurray wildfires and the 2011 Slave Lake wildfires. But as you can see on the first graph here, when you think back to the last graph that I had that showed where the Métis were dispersed throughout Canada, there's a ton of overlap of evacuation and wildfire uh, incidences around our communities. And Indigenous communities in Canada are routinely exposed to disproportionate risks of the impacts of wildfires. Since the 1980s, approximately one third of wildfire evacuations and more than half of all smoke-related evac evacuations have involved Indigenous communities, despite Indigenous communities only making up 5% of the Canadian population. Information on how these evacuations and impacts have spe specifically affected Métis communities is often difficult to ascertain. That said, the folks at uh, m &A have been very kind in sharing some st statistics from this year that I'll elaborate on later. And what we also don't recognize in these statistics here are the losses experienced by farmers and wage laborers and landowners who are evacuated and unable to tend to their crops or go to their jobs. Uh, it doesn't capture the psychological effects and the community losses that are results of evacuations to unsafe circumstances. So what's really clear here is that the Métis and Métis communities have, be under, have been underserved, underprepared, and underequipped to properly respond to and adapt to the increasing threat of wildfire. And this is a pattern that will only be exacerbated by climate change. But before I get to that, I'm gonna have a much needed sip of water and toss it back to Allie to open up another poll. Thanks, Dane. All right, we'll get another question here. Just asking if you or your family um, have been affected by wildfires in the last few years.
Right, about two thirds of people have answered. I'll give it another few seconds. Right, I'll end it there and share. So lots of people have been affected by air quality. Um, definitely health impacts there. We have three people who've been evacuated um, and others who've been affected in other ways and a few people that haven't been affected. So I'm happy to talk about that in the question period at the end or share any stories or experience if anybody would like to. Hope you got your water there, Dane, back to you. I don't know. Oh, wait. Am I muted? Okay, I'm not muted. Okay, great. Um, really good at this technological stuff. So moving forward, uh, let's talk a bit about how climate change factors into this. So climate change is one part of it, but there's also the mismanagement of our forests. So as climate change, the mismanagement of our forests continues, the Insurance Bureau of Canada has begun to warn that parts of the Métis motherland will become uninsurable to fire us. And this continues the impacts of wildfires communities long after the flames have been smothered. Wildfire season now extends several months longer than it ever has as a result of climate change. The severity and magnitude of fire seasons has been on a steady increase. Fire scientists are warning that we have passed a climate tipping point in Western Canada as it pertains to wildfires. And this fire season in Canada alone is the third largest fire season in human history and we've only made it to August. That's an absolutely wild stat. The annual area burned and the annual number of fires are projected to quadruple and then double respectively over the next 50 to 60 years. And when it comes to these things, I, I, I normally I do my best to be friendly with my wording when it comes to critiques of fire management in Canada. And I don't want to lay blame at the feet of folks who are out responding and working around the clock to help protect your communities. But in my opinion, the current situation is a result of political, political systems and policymakers that uphold those systems. Gambling on status quo that's led to 4,178 MNA citizens evacuated this year alone. Losses of homes and livelihoods that won't be captured in statistics or insurance payouts, and the unacceptable loss of four wildland firefighters this year so far. When I began my career as a wildland firefighter, we were taught often and very clearly about the risks of the job. And it was a point of pride throughout Canada that we hadn't lost wildland firefighters in decades by the time that I had started. So to see four of the fraternity or family of wildfire uh, lose their lives this year has been absolutely tragic for the community. And to see those losses within community beyond the wildfire community has really weighed heavy on the folks out there that are on the front lines. And in Alberta, it's not the folks on the front lines who really get to call the shots. Wildfire decision-making in Alberta is primarily centralized in Edmonton and then dispersed through several wildfire districts throughout Alberta. And data analysis and province-wide resource and preparedness decision-making is often handled by folks sitting behind computer screens in Edmonton. And this centralization of preventative wildfire decision-making, and when I say preventative wildfire decision-making, I'm talking about springtime burning and uh, fire smart and different things that can protect communities before fire season. Uh, they're made by folks who don't know the lands like our Métis communities do. And they may ne never lay eyes on the fires that burn through them. And this colonial concept of bad fire that has admonished an integral part of our identity and alienated our co communities from a tool that is essential to not only connecting the land, but protecting our ways of life, it's continued and upheld in these offices and in these structures of wildfire. That's why I think personally, and this is often echoed by a lot of my colleagues, which I'm always very glad to hear. Uh, it's now time to really mark another chapter in our connection to fire in the land, to renew, reassess, and redeploy for the safety of our communities and our way of life. 
academia and colonial research are beginning to recognize how removing fire from the land and fire from Métis hands has left all those who call Canada home to risks of fire. And how bringing teachings and traditions of our past into our future creates a safer and healthier, healthier Métis nation. So in order to do this, and to kind of give a bit more insight to what the realities are for our firefighters on the ground, I'd like to dive in a bit to what things are kind of like for wildfire personnel in Alberta. But before I do that, another drink of water and another poll. Thanks, Dane. Um, so on the topic of, of health and safety, we have a question here about emergency preparedness and asking if your household has an emergency response plan in place. Maybe you do, maybe you're working on it, something you're thinking about. The MA has just developed um, a bunch of resources on this topic, which we will share. Um, we can share the link now and after when I send a follow up email. All right, looks like 23 people have responded. Give it another second here. All right, thanks everyone for answering that. As we can see here, um, quite a few people that don't have an emergency preparedness plan um, yet. Obviously not something you wanna think about, but some, some good homework that can, that can really come in handy later on. Um, like I said, we'll share those resources right away and there should be a link about a framework for creating a plan. Thank you. Before I move forward, I'd just like to shout out m as environment team for uh, working on getting preparedness kits and different resources out to folks throughout the m and um, Like Ali said, these preparedness plans, they aren't necessarily something you'd think about being a huge help, but they take anywhere from like half an hour to an hour to create. And when you need them, you're glad you have them. So uh, please do capitalize on those resources and share them throughout your networks. Um, but moving forward, uh, I got to admit, I was, I was a bit conflicted to include this part of the presentation uh, in tonight's spotlight, but I decided to go ahead with it since there is kind of a cone of silence in the world of wildfire management and what the reality is for our firefighters who are on the ground right now. And in my opinion, I owe it to those who have helped build my career and who I've stood alongside with on the fire line to advocate for these realities and make my community, the MA, aware of them as well. So, for boots on the ground firefighters, there's currently two designations that are uh, used in Alberta there's type one and type two crews. And type one crews are your hell attack crews and your unit crews. And those crews, they receive a high level of training support. Uh, they're direct employees of the government of Alberta. They receive AUPE union support, uh, longer guaranteed track contracts, and they're often trained in initial attack response. And so what initial attack response is, is when a fire is detected, they're the first crews that get sent out to go action or respond to those fires. And these crews, they're, they're predominantly staffed by young non-Indigenous folks from across Canada. Uh, they're often students working for summer jobs or thrill seekers and outdoorsy types. I myself, uh, I got into wildfire to pay for uh, my undergrad and jokes on me, I absolutely fell in love with it. And here we are now. Um, but then we also have type two crews and type two crews are crews that are often employed through a contractor that is employed via contract to the government of Alberta. And these are primarily staffed by First Nations and Métis firefighters, and there's usually a greater diversity of age ranges and backgrounds and experiences in wildfire management. Uh, these crews, they're, they're often the first to be cut. They may, be, they may experience lower wages and training opportunities as a result of the contracts. They usually have less access to benefits and are primarily used for sustained action fires. And sustained action fires are when you have a big massive fire like Chuck Egg or Fort McMurray that requires months and months of folks on the ground putting out these massive fires that are the size of cities sometimes, uh, that's the sustained action crews that do that. And type one crews and type two crews both do sustained action. 
However, type two crews usually aren't trained to do initial attack. Um, excuse me, I lost my spot here. So these crews are rarely trained nor deployed for initial response. However, they do perform the same job ultimately on incidents as any other firefighter, yet they don't receive the same benefits nor compensation as type one crews. And within Alberta wildfire, this can create a bit of a us and them atmosphere. Beyond that, career advancement for any wildland firefighters in Alberta has become an extreme retention problem as career advancement opportunities and training have been widely cut back. Um, beyond that, Alberta has had a history of favoring folks with a forest tech diploma from either NATE or colleges on the East Coast. And this has created what's known within the industry as the Forest Tech Old Boys Club. Uh, individuals with this forest tech pro uh, diploma are often fast tracked for promotional positions, regardless of experience or education and training that other individuals might have. Anecdotic anecdotically speaking, um, when I was doing my master's, I wanted to go do my master's so I could uh, get out of the fire line and move up within the career and uh, try to find new and innovative ways to uh, help fight fires and manage fires in Alberta. And I was at a conference while I was doing my master's and I was schmoozing like you wouldn't believe. And I was pestering a, a UCP staffer about, you know, how can I advance my career in wildfire and, and, and what can I do? I'm doing my master's. Is there anywhere I should focus? You know, what opportunity should I sniff out? And I was, I was told blank po point blank by this individual that I should drop out of my master's and go get a forest tech. Now, Think for a second of what kind of atmosphere that creates among decision makers within Alberta wildfire. Like, what kind of space that creates for innovative thinking and keeping up to speed with research and technology in this field. And in my opinion, all of this ultimately leads to the disadvantage of wildfires and the wildland firefighters and the communities that they protect. Alberta has been absolutely plagued in the last four years or so by increasingly high turnover and the loss of experienced firefighters to British Columbia, Parks, uh, Saskatchewan, the Yukon, areas where compensation and work atmosphere are more accommodating to individuals, where career advancement is an opportunity. Firefighters in Alberta are now understaffed, burnt out, and they're all together fed up with mistreatment of type one, of type one and type two crews. And all this is done within the name of saving money on man hours. This is a massive gamble for communities in the, the WUI, and we're seeing it this year. There needs to be better support for all our wildland firefighters to experience career advancement, training opportunities, year-round employment, job security, innovative approaches to wildfire management. This militaristic and outdated system we're employing is not rising to the challenges we can see. And I believe the structure of wildfire management is definitely ripe for a change, but it's also an area where a rising tide can raise all ships. And it's also a place where truth and reconciliation can occur in a tangible and meaningful way. A place from where all for folks from all walks of life can gather around the knowledge and the truth of the land and reconcile the colonial legacy opposed upon the land for the betterment of all those who call this place home. Now imagine if we didn't have this type one and type two system, all firefighters received the same compensation, respect and training. Indigenous and non-Indigenous firefighters were taught about taking part in cultural burns that involve community, bringing good fire back to those communities in a way that everyone can gather around. Now, I have the for great fortune of representing the Métis National Council in a lot of different international forums and in those forums, I get to interact with some Indigenous folks from all around the world, and it's been an absolutely wonderful experience. And walking through and away from those spaces, it's changed my perspective on truth and reconciliation. And when I think about truth and reconciliation and all the different ways that it can be actioned, one thing always springs to my mind, the Maori haka. Now, if anybody's ever watched a rugby game, or maybe you've never even watched a rugby game, you've probably seen this. It's, it's that Maori war dance that the New Zealand All Blacks do before every game. And everyone knows it, everyone sees it, it's powerful. It shows pride and respect for the culture. Everybody takes part in it. And I often think in Canada, you know, where's our haka? 
Where can we find a pride that transcends this colonizer indigenous divide? And I've been taught by my elders and different fire keepers that I've had the privilege of interacting with that fire here is not only the land, but community as well. I fully believe traditional burning is something that all backgrounds can gather around in Canada and find pride in the traditions and the sciences that connect us to the land. I've talked quite a bit so far about how Métis fire heals the land and creates wildfire resiliency. I'd like to take some time now to like dive in a bit deeper into that. And I usually give this talk to, or one similar to it to folks who are already involved in the world of wildfire. So you'll have to forgive me if I'm a bit high level at times on some things, or maybe this is just my ploy to have you all ask me lots of questions so I didn't need to prepare as much. I'll leave that up to you to determine. But at the beginning of this discussion, I talked about how those Laurentide glaciers, uh, when they receded and the forest progressed and transformed across the land, our ancestors were there for every inch of that glacier receding. And so was their fire. So the genetic development of each and every tree on this landscape has encoded within it experiences of our ancestral fires. Think for a minute what that may mean. Our fires, they, they help to determine riparian buffers, which is a fancy word for trees that grow along, along riverbanks and stabilize and influence the pattern of waterways. Our fires, they influence the cycling of muskeg in the northern wetlands and the creation and maintenance of an expansive prairie that extends from Lac La Biche to Laredo, Texas. Our ancestral fires can be thought of as one of the most expansive feats of ecological engineering and human history. And I'm, I've, I've said that before in front of the head of Schulich Engineering, and he fully agreed. So it's, it's, got a, it's got a green stamp from Western academia too when I say that. But our ancestors, they used fire as a bulldozer, a road builder, a plow, a fertilizer. But our ancestral fires also served purposes that are now more valuable than ever. Providing buffers against wildfires, maximizing carbon cycling, providing food security in areas that might be stricken to drought. Now I mentioned those prairie towns that are no longer prairie towns and they're now embedded in thick boreal forest or what might be deemed the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface. Now I want you to picture that boreal forest that those towns are embedded in as an ocean, a giant unbroken ocean of trees and wildfire is a wave. And as that wave of fire burns through that ocean of trees, it gains more and more energy and more momentum and until it becomes an unstoppable force, a tidal wave of fire. Some call it a mega fire. I'm not a huge fan of the term, but that's neither here nor there. Now picture that same ocean, but there's an archipelago, if I'm saying that correctly, I was born in the prairies, I don't, I don't deal with the ocean, but you have a chain of islands of Métis burns that were done to keep portages open or maybe provide a medicine garden or hunting trails. And they were burned at different times and won't burn again for a, a long time since. And over here, you have a couple of islands of meadows and prairies that are burnt to attract ungulates and provide hunting grounds and, and more food for animals in the area. Now imagine you have those islands and archipelagos and whatever other terms and East Coasters on the call are probably screaming out right now. And imagine that same wave of fire comes through and it hits those islands and it loses steam. And by the time it comes to threaten communities, it's manageable. It can be dealt with. It's not a Lytton or a Fort McMurray or a Slave Lake or these tragedies that we're just becoming accustomed to. And in the meantime, should a fire not come through those areas, ecological integrity and output is bolstered. Plants and animals that provide food security for our communities have more favorable habitat and available food sources. Invasive species and climate refugee species that aren't supposed to be here and aren't accustomed to our ancestral fires, they're hampered 
And our local flora and fauna, well, they're given the upper hand to regrow and take back the land. In Canada, we don't account for the carbon that's released into the atmosphere as a result of wildfires. However, we do account for the carbon that is captured through post-burn regrowth so we can subsidize the carbon output of certain in in industries that have historically suppressed Métis wildfire. What if we finally had an honest discussion about that? What if we finally did the math on how much it costs to have these unstoppable megafires that have round the clock response cabs, helicopters, diesel engines, side-by-sides, two strokes, back burns, dozer guards, et cetera, et cetera. How much it costs not only in tax dollars, but carbon output, economic damage to our communities, mental, social, and spiritual damage to our communities. And what if we compared that cost to what can be saved economically, financially, socially, et cetera, by returning fire to the land? By returning to fires of choice as opposed to fires of chance. Now, I'm not saying returning fire to the land today will be a silver bullet that stops all wildfires and wildfire-related tragedies. But I am saying that returning fire to the land through Métis hands via springtime burns that are focused towards cultural and contemporary goals, we can provide not only wildfire resiliency to all communities in Canada, but we can also reduce wildfire risk, increase biodiversity, and put forward actionable climate solutions that are in line with truth and reconciliation. Recognizing that our fires are a truth of the land as we are, and reconciling our culture and people's place in the future and fight against climate change. Now, some examples of this, these are all very high level wild things I'm talking about, but some tangible examples of this that I've already seen happen are burns done by First Nations communities in BC to create medicine gardens that support community healing and community health. Burns utilized in Northern BC to coax buffalo away from grazing along highways to reduce numbers of collisions undertaken by somebody who's on the call today, a big shout out to Dr. Sonia Leverkus. And recognizing that our fires are, or sorry, I'm reading my lines twice here. I've also seen burns carried out in the Cumberland Delta to create a habitat for muskrat and culturally important species. And these burns being used as a lesson to teach children about our culture and our history with fire. Now, one of my favorite examples of these tangible solutions that fire creates uh, are actually on the slides right here. It was the Métis Nation of Alberta Rocky Mountain House cultural burn that took uh, place last fall in Rocky Mountain House. So I'm not sure if anybody on this call had the opportunity to be there. If you did, please put it in the chat. Um, I'd like to hear your kind of take on it. But before I really tell you about that burn, I'd, I'd like to kind of acknowledge some of the folks who continue the legacy of fire um, for the Métis Nation of Alberta. Folks who carry the flame and have really not only carried the flame, but have been a, a wonderful inspiration and help in my career. Uh, I'd like to recognize Amy Cardinal Christensen, Paul Couturier, Lauren LaRondell, Lyle Lawrence, Josh Mitchell, Ramsey Mudrick, and Sonia Leverkus, who's also on the call. Uh, not only for all the work that you've been doing for wildfire management, but also all the help and inspiration you've given me. But back to the Rocket Mountain House uh, cultural burn, which took place last fall. Uh, when I think about that, I think of a lot of the interviews that I did. And when I think of those interviews and talking to Métis firefighters, researchers, practitioners, knowledge keepers, every one of them spoke to changes in how we connect to fire. And they spoke of a fear that the, the next generation of Métis people won't have access to our relationship to fire, to our teachings and our wisdom and our culture around fire. That the flame that we've carried since time immemorial, passed from our ancestors to us, may be extinguished before it has the opportunity to be passed. My generation of Métis peoples does not know the community and wisdom of spring burns. We don't know the teachings and knowledge that have connected our community in fire and the land. And when I was at the cultural burn workshop in Rocky Mountain House, where we returned fire to the land through Métis hands, in the context of Métis culture with teachings and lessons and ceremony and celebration all around turning fire to the land. It was one of the most remarkable experiences in my career. And having been a wildland firefighter for six years and 
travel all around doing it. I've seen some amazing and remarkable things that I never imagined I'd see in my lifetime. And I had to have to say that one of the most remarkable memories I have of my relationship to wildfire was being on that burn and seeing the looks on the faces of the kids and their parents and their families as they watch the fire grow and begin to breathe and move and dance on the land and take a life of its own. And just seeing kids younger than my nephews and niece holding the drip torch and putting fire on the land, seeing the spark of wonder in their eyes as Paul Couturier shared teachings that he'd learned from his elders and his profound respect and connection of, to fire. Most of all, I was sensing the pride and the sense of community on the land those days. It's something I'll never forget, and I'm really hoping that we can continue to replicate in the future and bring to Métis Nation of Alberta citizens and Métis citizens across the homeland. Now, before I wrap up here, I'd like to just talk a bit about how fire has been a part of me and a part of my history. And I was born and raised in Treaty 7 territory. I was born in Calgary, uh, raised in a suburb, and I was what some might refer to as a city for most of my life. And growing up, I never really felt much connection to my Métis heritage. I was born with a Métis grandfather I would never know. Um, I grew up with very little to no exposure to the, the forest, the land, the sounds of nowhere. And when I began my career as a wildland firefighter, I really began my discovery and connection to the community. And in my mind, I was born into the Métis community in 2019 on the Chuck Egg Creek wildfire, standing shoulder to shoulder with Métis firefighters, protecting Métis communities, homes and livelihoods from the approaching flames. Wildfire is my absolute passion. It's been my passion since I flew towards my first smoke column in 2013. And I was completely overcome with awe and a feeling that I can't explain with any words. Fire has given me lifelong friends, teachings, memories. It's now given me my identity as a Métis man. And I would like to take a moment to thank you all for joining me today, listening to my story, the story of Métis fire. And I'm very excited to answer any questions you might have or elaborate on anything that I might have missed or tripped up on in my presentation. As you can tell, uh, I absolutely love this stuff and I'm, I'm, I'm always ready to talk about it at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday in the dead of summer. <laughs> so with that, um, thank you very much and I'll pass things back to Allie now. Awesome, thank you so much, Dane. Um, what a great presentation, really informative, uh, educational, interesting. Um, you can really hear the passion in your voice as you talk about this stuff. Um, thanks for being so vulnerable and sharing some emotions as well. Um, really great. I know it's it's like, you know, it is a summer night and you could talk about this. So I really thank you for taking some time to do this um, and for everybody for being here. Um, you know, we've seen lots on the news this summer about wildfires. And like you said, we keep seeing that word unprecedented every week. Um, so it's a timely, timely time to have this conversation um, and, and get into it a little bit. So um, we've had a few questions that have come in already, so I'll just go through chronologically here. Um, sorry in advance if I mispronounce anybody's name. Um, we have uh, Lorena asked um, if you could explain the seven fires prophecy a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I'll also just respond to your message with a resource that... Um, I used in my research, uh, Rekindling the Sacred Fire by, it's in my presentation, Fiona, I, I can't remember the last name right now, but um, Rekindling the Sacred Fire, that book, it, it, it's looking into Métis spirituality and how Métis spirituality was formed and developed uh, pretty much from the start of the Métis culture and identity. And so the Seven Fires prophecy was passed to us by our Anishinaabeg uh, relatives um, back in the Red River Valley. So I will give you my memory and interpretation of the Seven Fires Prophecy. Um, should it not be in line with other people's understandings, I don't mean any offense to any Anishinaabeg folks or any folks who um, are more familiar with this, but I'll give you my understanding of it. And so the Seven, Fire Proph Seven Fires Prophecy talks about seven fires in the history of the Anishinaabeg 
on what is now Canada or Turtle Island. Um, and it's, it's a creation story and it goes through the different phases and histories and prophecies of Indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples, Métis peoples in what is now Canada. And it speaks of several different fires. Uh, I believe, I'm just kind of going off the top of my head here. So I think it was fire five was the fire in which the Europeans um, were pro prophesized to come to uh, the Anishinaabeg communities. And this prophecy speaks of the destruction and the change to the way of life that was experienced by uh, that occurrence and that event and that meeting. And then the sixth fire, which is the fire that we're currently prophesized to be within is, and, and by the way, when I was reading this book and they talk about fires, I was reading it for like a month. And I was like, in my head, I was just like, oh yeah, they're talking about campfires. And then just one day it clicked, I was like, you, they're talking about fires on the land that regrow and renew and start a new cycle. And it finally clicked for me. So that's, I'm getting on a tangent here, but anyhow, uh, right now the prophecy is that we're in the sixth fire and the prophecy states that indigenous peoples and all peoples in Canada European as well, or settler, whatever term you would like to use, must find a way to work together and work in a good way to heal the land and to choose a, one of two paths forward. The path that is true to healing the land, such that all folks may prosper and move into the future in the seventh fire in a brighter way, or a path of continuing to uh, abuse and neglect and exploit the land, uh, which will ultimately lead to ruin and destruction. Um, if you're drawing any parallels here to our current reality, I am too. But that's my understanding of the Seven Fires Prophecy. I highly recommend checking out Chantal Fiola's book, Rekindling the Sacred Fire. Uh, she is a Métis author, Métis researcher, and there is so much information and knowledge in there. Much better than I can relay to you right now. Awesome. And thank you for everybody who shared the links and the names or the author of that book. Um, Dave, maybe do you want to just end your slides and we can be maybe a little bit more conversational here? Definitely. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Moving along. Next question here we have from Lori Thompson. Um, the majority of the Indigenous communities in the North are First Nations or Métis settlements. Um, what Métis communities in the North are being referred to from a Métis Nation perspective? Um, I'm not sure if there was a, I'm sorry, I should have captured which slide or what you're talking on. Um, when you asked that, was was there anything you wanted to elaborate on there, Lori, or anything you want to address, Dane? Um, I'll give Lori a second here before I put my foot in my mouth. Okay, I'll go in blind. Um, so, when I'm using Métis communities, uh, that, that, that term in my presentation, I'm really trying to purposely be as vague as possible about it, um, just because there are political sensitivities within my role as policy advisor for the Métis National Council. And I have to be as inclusive as possible in the language that I do and don't use. So when I am using the Métis word, the term Métis communities, uh, in the context of this presentation, I'm, I'm really talking to, uh, you know, a community that could be as big as a family on a farmstead to a city of, you know, 10 to 20,000 people with a significant Métis population. So I think that's the safest possible answer I can give. Sorry, sorry, but that doesn't answer it. Thanks, Dane. Um, all right, I have a, we have a few more questions. Thanks, everybody, for having these roll in. Um, just a reminder, we have until 7.30 tonight, so we have a good good more chunk of time for questions. Um, from Dr. Sonia Lavarcus, Dane, excellent presentation. Um, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you were a firefighter or when you started on this wildland fire path? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when I used to fight fire, my uh, my nickname was Bad News to Suze because uh, I'd always managed to run into some bad luck or poor decision making. So I could probably 
fill an encyclopedia encyclopedia with things I wish I would have known going into the fire line. But um, you know, thinking back then, um, you know, there's just no way I could have prepared for the amount of personal um growth that would come from wildfire. And, you know, just how profoundly remarkable it is to be dropped off in a forest by a helicopter and you're standing in front of this wall of flames and the helicopter flies away and then you can't hear it anymore. And it just kind of hits you, not like a rock, but like, you know, like a trickle of water down the spine or something like, oh, right. No one is coming to help. I am the help. Um, you know, I, I, I wish I would have kind of looked at fire a bit more seriously in my first years as an actual career path and maybe asked a lot more questions about why things were done a certain way and whether it was the right way to do things. Um, but I also wouldn't, I, I, I don't know, I, 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 it's, it's such a good question, but for anybody who's interested or curious about this work or becoming a wildland firefighter or getting into that world, uh, you know, if I had to impart what I wish I would have known or what I wish I could tell you is that um, just be prepared for it to, to change your life and uh, really accept that you have to go in head first because it's it's a lifestyle, it's not a job. Um, and if you love it, it becomes your entire life. It's more than a lifestyle at a certain point. So I think that's how I'd answer that one. Awesome. Also, I'm really happy for people to jump in and ask their own questions if anybody feels like it. Um, I don't need to talk this whole time. Um, our next one's from Beth, and then I have one from Dr. Sonia Vargas again, and then Wendy, and then Cole, just as a heads up. Um, so Beth asked, um, I would love to learn more about what equipment or what strategies are used in cultural burns. Ooh, that's a great question. So yeah, I didn't talk about that enough. So yeah, like in the springtime burns, so so Métis burning uh, usually occurs or pretty much always occurs in the spring, sometimes in the fall, but not as much. And so what would happen is before the snow was all melted or before, um, you know, the forest really got hot and crispy, folks would get together they would analyze the landscape. They'd look what was there, what could be done, what could be done. Talk about, oh, well, we burned here a couple of years ago. Maybe we should do it again. Or, you know, I'd really like if we open this portage again, it's getting a bit, you know, overgrown. And so, like I said a bit earlier in my presentation, that would bring together folks from all different backgrounds, Métis, First Nations, settler, you name it. And a consensus would build. And then, you know, like any good prairie community, you went out together to help out your neighbor, right? So you would all go out together, and um, you know, let's take for example, if you were you were building burning a field for um, medicine or something like that, or to keep a meadow open. You, from what I've seen, now there's probably a lot of different ways of doing this, and that's a cool part. Every time you talk to a Métis burner, they're like, "Oh, well, we do it this way," and "Oh, no, we do it that way," and it's all very specific specific to land, community, family, etc. But uh, before there was like drip torches or gasoline to light things up, uh, they would take bundles that, I'm not sure if there was a like type of fur or just like a type of fuel, like, you know, um, shavings from like a different trees. And they would soak them in like fats and oils, usually animal fats and oils, and put them on like a, a string and drag them along the field. And now you're not just doing this on, oh, we're doing it because it's Tuesday and I got something Wednesday, so we got to do it tonight. You know, you'd, you'd take into consideration all of the factors going around. You know, what's the wind doing? Um, how how moist is the field? All of these different things. And then that would determine the burn. Uh, a cool anecdote from that is um, when I was at the cultural burn in Rocky Mountain House, Rocky Mountain House, uh, the burn for liability reasons, parks had to lead it. And, you know, it was a bit of a bummer, but Parks guys were awesome. And a lot of them were colleagues of mine I'd worked with. And uh, Paul Couturier was there, who was our elder. And Paul's had like a 40-year career in wildfire. And it was funny because we all sat on the tailgate in the morning of the burn. And we went, okay, 
we got a FFMC of blah, 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 and a uh, Duff moisture code of 42, and then uh, winds out of the west at this, and then drought code of this, and so we should get crossover at this time, so, uh, you know, be careful about this, that, and this. And we all walked away. And, I, and you do this every time you go on a fire and wildfire, and, like, to this day, like, yes, I know what those things mean, but for the average firefighter, it's like, oh, yeah. And then we all went out to the field, the four of us, the four firefighters. And we all went to a different corner of the field. And we did this without talking. We did this without planning. It just naturally occurred. We all went out, reached down in a corner of the field, picked up some grass, rubbed it in our hands and threw it in the wind. Reached down again, pick it up, rub it in our hands and give it a smell this time. We all did the exact same thing. And then we came back into the center of the field and Paul turns to me and he goes, well, Dane, what'd you see in, in your corner of the field? Oh, well, you know what? The grass smells a little damp still, but you know, you can see the way the sun's tracking by about an hour from now, you know, that should start to dry out. How about over in your corner? He said, ah, you know, when I, when I broke up the grass, I just didn't really feel like it was ready to burn. You know, maybe if we start over there and we get some favorable winds, you know, that might help us. And that's how we went around the circle and determined how we were going to do the burn that day. And that's how it's always been done. That's how it's done every day on the fire line. And when I talked about the centralization of decision-making in fire management, that's what I mean. It's that, that readout of, oh, yeah, you got all these numbers which bleed into these numbers, which mean this, that are computed and pumped out in Edmonton. But we're on the ground in Rocky Mountain House, and I can pick up that grass and tell you how it's going to burn. So that was another part of like the technology and um, kind of like the science that went into how uh, Métis people would burn and still do burn. Um, so I hope that answered your question. If it doesn't, feel free to toss in a follow-up. Awesome. Um, Sonia, I'm going to put you on the spot. I see your camera on. Did you want to ask your next question about the kind of calls to action? Uh, sure. A really great job, Dane. I just really appreciate your presentation and thanks everybody for having us to join you. Uh, I was just wondering, what do you want to task us to do? All of us who are uh, listening to you and participating with you. And I think you have about 30 people here. So what can we do? What do you think we should do either at putting good fire out on the land or at a community? I don't know everybody. So at a community level or a political level, what what can we do? Awesome. Thanks, Sarnia. Um, you know, I I hope that I've been able to kind of instill a bit of passion or maybe spark uh, some some other flames here. But uh, I would really just hope just go out and, and and give it a Google. Look into indigenous fire management. Look at the, to what they do in Australia and California, uh, Africa. Look at what they they've done in the Métis homeland. Look at, look at, you know, pull a sweater thread and try to really think about fire. What fire means to you? Is fire bad? Is fire good? Try to kind of develop that for yourself. Come to your own conclusions, you know, um, look into the things that are out there. We're, we're currently doing our best at the Métis National Council and uh, through other venues to, to draw all those things together and make those readily available. There's some wonderful links and resources that I'm sure Ali and Jen are going to share at the end of this. You know, pull those sweater threads and look at them and, and get that education and language. And then from there, you know, and this one is, I say this on behalf of my fellow wildland firefighters, always support them. Never accept a budget cut to wildland fire. Never accept the fact that there's firefighters out there right now who are working 18 hour days haven't had a wage increase in God knows how long or eating white bread sandwiches and sleeping in the dirt. And they're told they're expendable and their contract should be up this fall. You know, um, firefighting is a profession that should be taken as seriously as structural firefighting in a city. You know, we have city firefighters who have wonderful jobs. They provide so much to our communities um, and they are trained in wildland fire management. So why aren't we giving the same respect um, and the same opportunities and the same structures to our wildland firefighters. You know, uh, I said earlier about how there is this kind of like weird racist divide in wildfire. And I, you know, I, I do maintain that a rising tide needs to raise all ships here. And uh, we need to support all our wildland firefighters to get as much opportunities and trainings as they can. So I think that's what I'd like to leave folks with is, you know, when you are 
um, concerned about these things. You know, think of the folks that are on the ground there. And then beyond that, you know, um, should you have the ability to influence any political situation or write your MLA or whatever, put this bug in their ear because I, I work in policy. I, I have the most Albertan job in the world. I just yell at people in Ottawa all day. But the folks who make this policy, even in Alberta, they've never seen a wildfire for the most part. You know, the folks who actually get to call the shots and make a decision, they usually stare at a spreadsheet. They don't, they don't go to Slave Lake. They don't go to Fort McMurray. They don't go to East Prairie. So um, I think that's what I'd like to, to ask of the folks on this call is, you know, educate yourself as best as you can. And when you do have the opportunity to influence or share, uh, please do. Or send them my way. Awesome, great answer. Um, all right, just in the name of time, we have seven minutes left and five questions. So maybe we can rapid fire these ones. Um, have you, uh, from Wendy, Dane, have you ever been able to give this presentation to the forests, forestry or indigenous relations minister? If so, were they receptive? So this presentation itself, I gave a modified version of this at Wildfire Canada in Edmonton this fall, uh, and there was a really, really good uh, reception to it. Uh, the feedback I did receive was mostly from academia, um, researchers, and folks who are actually in the know, which is awesome, because when folks who are actually in the know are gathering around and saying, hey, right on, and they're from UBC or one of these places, it's it's really good to see because that means that the dominoes are starting to go. Um, I have also been part of the Canadian Council of Forest Ministers Roundtable Dialogue on Wildland Fire and Indigenous Fire Management. Through my role at MMC, I do a absolute ton of advocacy for emergency management resilience, uh, funding and opportunities for the entire Métis Nation. Uh, I have had similar conversations at the UN, um, speaking with nations ranging from Australia, Canada, Norway, um, US, UK on how important this is and some of the different topics that I've talked about today. Um, and there is a receptiveness to this. However, one of the big roadblocks is liability. No one really wants to stick their neck out and say, let's give this a try. It's really easy to be timid about burning and stuff like that because, you know, should things get out of control, it's very easy to blame someone. But does anybody on this call really feel like things are in control right now? That was my mic drop moment. What's the next question? <laughs> cool. OK, this really leads into the next question um, from Cole Christian. Uh, hi, Dan. Good to see you. Uh, excellent talk. My question is, what role should Métis Nation government policymakers and institutions play in reclaiming and advocating for cultural burning? Paul, well, great to see you here, and thank you for the question. Um, support your citizens who are doing this stuff, especially in Saskatchewan. We're, we're losing our elders. We're losing the last people who actually know what our burning is, who actually have been there for our burns who have that knowledge of the land, who have that connection, support your citizens in gathering around that knowledge and those elders and those folks in our communities that keep the flame. Because everyone who does it, does it out of passion. I mentioned Renee and Solomon Carrier. Um, I know you're out in m and and do everything you can to get a hold of them because they're just so remarkable and supporting them and bringing our community around this. Because I mean, Métis governments, citizens are first and foremost, right? So that's how I'd like to see Métis governments across the nation um, approach this, is supporting citizens first to gather around this knowledge and the folks who maintain it. And then beyond that, you know, I can't influence provinces in my role. I, I'm at the federal level. Uh, but with a lot of the, uh, with the, the new constitution we have coming in m and and a lot of these uh, different self-government governance opportunities that are coming up, there's a lot more opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one discourse um, with provinces. And that's where the rubber can really hit the road and some change can be made. And in order to do that, we're gonna to need to have those citizens who can carry the flame because I would love to do it 24 seven around the clock, but I do sleep sometimes. 
Great. Um, our next question is from Elder Norman Spicer um, regarding the BC cultural burning where Buffalo stayed by the road. It was mentioned that they don't like sage. Are you bringing this information to the discussion for government to plant sage by the highway? Does this ring a bell? It wasn't my research. Um, it was a situation I was made aware of. But Elder Norma Spicer, if you would like to give me more information on that, I would love to dive into that. And then, like I said, bring that to the awareness of different uh, organizations that I'm a part of, uh, such as the Thunderbird Collective, which is an organization I'm a part of that is uh, developing and advocating for Indigenous burning cross-culturally across Canada. And I think that'd be a wonderful spot to bring something like that up. But unfortunately, I, I don't have much more to elaborate on that. I'm just looking, and I'm not sure if she is still on the call. Oh, yeah, she is. Um, would you like to speak to that at all? Which which one? Sorry, uh, Elder Norma. Or maybe we can have a conversation about that later. We have a couple uh, minutes. Just, yeah, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I heard this. I, I think I, it was through the Ecological Buffalo, which was a uh, scientific presentation by a couple of scientists. And uh, they spoke about sage and the buffalo. Uh, let me look up what I have and, uh, and I'll send it to you by email at your in, in, uh, in Ottawa. Please do. Um, and, and to that note, uh, Elder Norman Spicer, it's just jumped to mind that, uh, you know, historically and culturally, um, buyers were set to ceremonially and functionally prepare the land for buffalo herds and to make sure that the grasses, the flora that they, they, they like to feast upon were available for them to ensure their health, etc. So uh, I'm sure whether Sage was keeping them away or bringing them close, uh, that was part of a burn plan if uh, Bison were, were one of the end goals there. So that's something that we're definitely hoping to uh, unearth and uh, speak some truth to in different venues. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but Dane, can we contact you if we have more questions? Yeah, I might be slow on my response, but um, I'll I'll give you a different email than my actual work email. And I'll share that through um, the MA. Or I'll just put it in the chat. Sounds good. And sorry, I know we're at 7:30. We just have two quick questions left. Um, from Lori, well done, Dane. I enjoyed your presentation. Um, would you be able to share your references? Yeah. Um it might be a bit nebulous to share all of those. Uh, however, the MNC wildfire report should be coming up pretty soon here, at which time it will be released nationwide. And then I would be glad if you have an email you want to share, I could send it to you. I think last time I looked into the bibliography of that thing, I was like well over 200 references. It was just thinking about it makes me sweat. Yeah, and we'll share all the links um, that we talked about in this uh, session um, and a few more. I'll, you'll get a really long email from me in a few days. Um, and then finally, we'll just have one question left um, from Elder Norma again, um, uh, referencing, has this information been presented to insurance companies who are paying dearly for the damage to property? Yeah, so I mentioned a bit earlier how liability is a large barrier to putting fire back on the land. And um, the unfortunate reality is that Data drives decision making um, and policy making. And the folks who have the best abilities and capabilities to um, collate and manage this data are insurance companies. However, they manage data around wildfires, emergencies, disasters in such a way that it meets their bottom line. It helps them determine your deductible, what you're insurable for, et cetera, et cetera be that as it may. Um, but insurance companies don't put together the interconnectedness of these things um, because it doesn't befit their bottom line. 
So an example of this is the second week of my career at the Métis Nation. I was like in a meeting that I was just thrown into and second week, I'm not about to put up my hand, but we got to a section on wildfire um, and I won't name names or I'll try to be a bit vague here since these are my colleagues and a presentation was given on adaptation around wildfires. And this gentleman used an example of wildfires in California and was talking about, oh, you know, all these houses burnt down, but the trees didn't. And, you know, we don't want to be like California. And then two slides later, his solution was, we're going to subsidize cladding for houses based on the California wildfire code. So I couldn't help myself but put my hand up and say, hey, um, you can't do this because if you do put this cladding on houses, you create what's called the preparedness paradox, where people think they're safe because they put some cladding up. But the fact of the matter is when a fire is raging, there's nothing in the world that can stop it. Um, I can tell you that from experience. And there's folks in this province who can tell you that from experience. And I then mentioned how the structure of the forest and how the forest was naturally built influenced why those trees didn't burn, but the houses did. And the response I got from that was essentially, well, too late. So I'm not saying there's any malice ending this or these folks don't care. It's just when things are driven by the insurance industry, they're driven by the insurance industry's bottom line. Um, so are these companies aware of these increasing risks? More than anyone. Are they aware of uh, you know, the liabilities and things around those more than anyone, but does it meet their bottom line to influence provinces and wildfire management agencies to increase cultural burning, et cetera, et cetera. If you're an insurance company that's based out of Delaware or God knows where I is probably, it's probably not something that's coming up at a board meeting, but I am doing my best to influence these spaces. So are the folks at MNA, MNS, MNBC, MNO, LFMO. All the governing members are so fantastic about putting a voice forward for this and getting into different spaces, whether it's the UN, whether it's the Insurance Bureau or the CCF, uh, Canadian Council of Forest Ministers. You know, we are doing our best to carry that voice into those spaces. Um, and there's a lot of folks at this call who are, are, are doing exactly that, banging pots and pans. So this reality can be heard. Great. Thanks, Jane. I think that's a really nice note to, to end this on. Um, thanks again for everybody who joined us tonight. Um, thanks to everybody in the future who's watching this recording. Um, really great to, to see see some lots of faces here tonight. And thanks again, Jane, for, for sharing with us. That was, that was fantastic. Thanks for having me. And thank you to everyone for joining. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all the great questions. Y'all take care. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.